you, Lord, for Jeffrey and his good work. Um, Carol is going to come up and share our first scripture right now, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. I must go on boasting, although there is nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth, but I am a but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing, surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, and persecutions, and difficulties. For um, when I am weak, I am strong. Amen. Amen. Anybody resonate with that scripture? Yeah. Second scripture is one that I have read here many times. It's one of my favorites. It's from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And, Paul says, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that a great scripture? <clears throat> well, I frequently uh, allude to things that uh, come from my past. Uh, some of you are my age or older. You remember some stuff. A lot of you are not my age. So you, if you don't remember, probably 45 years ago, there was a song called, Is That All There Is? by Peggy Lee. Some people are nodding. Those of you who are too young, just trust me on this. But in that song, yeah, Google it. Is that all there is? I just was thinking of that song last week when I wrote this sermon. And uh, I, I well, YouTube it, and there it was. In the song, she's talking in this kind of melatone, mel melancholy tone. Uh, He's kind of talking and then singing, kind of that type of song. She saw a circus, and even in the midst of all the clowns and the acrobats and the sounds and the colors, she says, is that all there is to a circus? And then she falls in love, she's abandoned, she finds that she lives through it, but she said, is that all there is to love? Then she imagines that she's leaving this mortal plane, and she'll be asking herself, is that all there is? But unfortunately, this, this isn't a Christian song. The chorus of the song, between all these spoken verses is, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Well, if that's all there is, my friends, let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. Again, that's not the conclusion I want us to come to today here in church. This world around us is not all there is. But there's no need to break out the booze and dance in despair. If all we had was this life down here, then life would be just a matter of finding the greatest amount of pleasure and avoiding pain at all costs. 
We would do all we can to ignore any information about war or illness or the declining economy. We would just cocoon ourselves with our loved ones and just try to avoid unpleasantness. But this physical world obviously is not all there is. We as Christians already believe that uh, we, we sometimes might wonder in our Christian life if this is all there is. We're here in this church every Sunday and we sing the hymns and the choruses. We see our friends across the aisle. We hear a sermon. We hear the prayers. We put our offering in the basket. We drink our cup of coffee and that might be about it. During the week, if we do what we should, we open our Bible and read it, hopefully every day, maybe most days. We pray when we go to bed at night. Maybe we whisper a few other prayers during the day when something concerns us. But now and then, we might ask ourselves, as we consider our Christian life, is this all there is? Now Paul, in our passage this morning, talks about a man he knows, uh, and everyone assumes by this that he means himself. It's kind of like if you go to the psychologist and say, I have this friend who has a problem. But Paul reports in this passage that God took him up to what he calls the third heaven. Nobody really seems to know exactly what he means by this. What, what's the second heaven? We don't know. It took Paul 14 years after this incredible experience of being taken to heaven to even speak of it. Isn't that amazing? I guess it was just such an awesome thing that he really couldn't put it into words right away. I was kind of asking God this week, hey God, how come I haven't had a chance to take this free trip to the third heaven? I think I could be a way more effective preacher if I could personally report to you that I have seen the streets paved with gold. I've seen the throne of God himself. I've seen the legions of angels singing their divine oratorios, the houses that God is preparing for the faithful, the cool gold harps. I can't wait to get my hands on one of those. But if God would take me up to see all of that. I don't think it would take me 14 years to tell you guys about it. But I do think it's really amazing that God mentioned this experience, or that Paul mentioned this experience of being taken up to the third heaven, and, and that God chose to include in our Bible this powerful witness. Somebody get the phone. <laughs> That's okay. I'm terribly sorry. That's okay. It's probably something important. Pray that it's okay. Those of us that are old enough to know that song, is that all there is? Remember that that's what a phone used to sound like, right? You had to go to the wall and pick it up. And you didn't even know who it was until you said hello. You couldn't read on there. So anyway, isn't it amazing that even though we don't have a lot of descriptions of what heaven is like, we do have this account that there is such a thing as heaven. And if there is such a thing as heaven, it kind of seems somewhat important to try to figure out how to get there, right? We don't want to end up in the other place. Because of our love for Jesus, we as Christians make this daily choice to live the way that he's commanded. And as Christians, our belief that there is more than this world, that does influence the decisions that we make every hour. But even so, I think sometimes as Christians, we might still sometimes ask, is this all there is? You know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I go to church, I read the Bible. Is that it? Shouldn't our Christian lives be full of deep satisfactions and prayer? Shouldn't we be just full of God's love every day for every person we meet? Shouldn't we sense that we're growing in heavenly wisdom? Shouldn't we uh, feel like we're overcoming the world and not experiencing the temptations that we used to feel? Shouldn't we be having some kind of incredible joy in God's presence more so than we do now? Well, I'm here to say that Paul's wish for the Ephesian believers, and I think it's the wish of, uh, of the Lord Jesus for us, for you and me today, is that there's more. Paul wrote in this passage in Ephesians, he described an incredibly deep walk with the Lord. He was talking about an appreciation or a perception of this vast love that Jesus has for every one of us and that he can place in us 
for the whole world. It's something much deeper than most of us have probably experienced up to this point. But there is this truth that we can see here, that there is more. This deeper experience of the love of Jesus is real and it is available to us. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. This idea that Jesus has more for you than you could ever imagine. The level of faith that you came in here with this morning is not all there is. Now Paul speaks of uh, God giving gifts to us from his glorious riches. And that's kind of an intriguing image, the glorious riches of God. We think of a person owning gold or property or beautiful paintings or fancy clothing, and yet God owns mountains full of gold that haven't even been mined yet. Not to mention, he owns all the gold that we think we own. God owns all the planets, all the landscapes and vistas all over the seas. And of course, God's other riches include his love, his word, his power. So from these riches of God, Paul goes on to say he wants to give us his strength. Now that is something considerable. Think of how much strength God has. God's strength holds all the planets together, all the molecules. His strength guides human history. His strength destroys wicked empires like the Pharaoh in Moses' day or Hitler and Stalin and Pol Pot. God wants to give you his strength, according to our passage. Do you need any more strength? Anybody? Yeah, I could. Use a little bit more? Yeah, I've got strength. Yeah. yeah. Do you need to be strengthened with power through God's Spirit in your inner being, as Paul has said? Or are you okay managing on your own? Yes. <laughs> are you doing perfectly at pushing away those extra desserts or not squandering money? Or do you say all the right things all the time to everybody? I know I need strength from the Lord. If you don't have all the strength that you need, then this is not all there is. There's more strength for you, according to Paul. God's offering to give you this strength from his glorious riches so that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. That's what it said. Now, Christ already dwells in our hearts if we've placed our faith in him. It says in the book of Colossians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. But do you think that you fully received Christ in all of your heart yet? I think there's more. I guarantee you, actually, there's more of Christ for you. I've been intrigued for years by this Trappist monk, uh, Thomas Merton, who died back in 1968. Merton felt the call of God to leave the world and seek the fullness of Christ in a silent monastic order. He made such progress in the monastery life that they allowed him to have his own little retreat house on the site of the monastery. And he went in there and wrote a whole bunch of books, many of which have become best-selling books. And he also was authorized to travel around the world sometimes. But when he first went out to that solitary retreat house, I read the account of this, he started, he kind of went stir-crazy, just month after month, alone in a house. No TV, no radio, just the Bible and some books and the walls. But he wrote about this experience of kind of going wacky in there, but he ended up writing this whole shelf full of important books. One of my favorites is called The New Seeds of Contemplation. He also wrote one called The Seven Story Mountain. Excellent books. But Merton reported that after a few months of kind of going crazy alone in the house, he actually did have an experience of more of the love of Christ than he ever had imagined he could experience. And I want to share a little bit of a long quote from him. It's just so great, so I hope you'll stay with me on this. He wrote after this experience of just being filled with the love of Christ. He said, for some people, it's quite easy to turn within themselves and find a simple picture of Christ in their imagination. And this is an easy beginning to prayer. But he says, for others, this doesn't succeed. He says, yet as we get beyond the doctrinal questions and the historical controversies about Jesus, we discover a simple and loving awareness of him who is really present in our souls by the gift of his personal love 
and his divine mission. This is what he was experiencing. This, he said this loving awareness of Jesus is a thing more real, more valuable by far than anything we can arrive at by our interior senses alone. He says for the picture of Jesus we might have in our imagination remains nothing but a picture. But the love that his grace produces in our hearts can bring us into direct contact with him as he really is. He says, for Jesus himself causes this love to spring up within us by a direct and personal effect of his will. He says, when his love begins to burn within us, surely there's no need for using our imaginations anymore. You get this idea, he experienced this and he's trying to write about it. He experienced the real presence, the love of Christ in himself. It took him months to get to this place where he was able to do this. There's something more that you and I know, and it has to do with this burning love of Christ within us. We can experience that in, in deep prayer, it would seem. Paul goes on to talk about this deep experience of Christ that he had. He wished for everyone in the church. He talks about this possibility of our being rooted and grounded in love so that we may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. He's talking about an experience. I like the way the Message Bible says this. You know, I love reading that just because I get kind of so familiar with the old uh, Bible that I've read my whole life. Somehow the Message says things in a different way and it makes me think. Here's what the Message says. Christ will live in you if you open the door and invite him in. And I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all Christians the extravagant dimensions of Christ's love. He says, reach out and experience the breadth. Test its length. <coughs> plumb the depths. Rise to the heights. Live full lives and live in the fullness of God. That's kind of an interesting way to say that same passage. Yeah. Some of the medieval writers noted that these dimensions of height and depth and width that Paul talked about, talk about are like the cross, up and down and right and left. Kind of an esoteric little thought, but what does it really come down to? I just want to ask you guys, do you really want to go all the way with Jesus? Are you willing to quit your little sinful games which are putting distance between you and Jesus? Are you willing to quit holding back and saying in your heart of hearts, I'm just not really ready to hand over everything? We probably are holding something back, aren't we? Yeah. Some little pleasure we think that we can't live without, or we prefer watching TV or reading pointless novels to cracking open God's Word. We prefer to doing almost anything to sitting down and praying for even 15 minutes. You know I struggle with this myself. I think a lot of us do, to just sit down and I'm going to pray. You and I don't have the eyes to see what more Jesus has for us, because our eyes are kind of glazed over with our fascination with the things of this world. We might think, is that all there is? But we haven't honestly looked for more. So these passages today came from a guy who gave up all that he had previously worked for. Paul gave his whole life to preaching the gospel and bringing new converts into the church. And God considered him worthy to reveal this glory of the third heaven to him. And yet Paul wasn't a lot more worthy than you and I are to take on these great responsibilities for God. He was actually quite sinful and prideful. He was even a murderer, we think. Way worse than probably you are. But Paul consciously said to God, Okay, God, here I am. Take my whole life. Use me in whatever way you choose. And then look what God did. What would happen if you said to God today, okay, I've pledged a portion of my monetary income, but I haven't really given my whole self to you, Lord. What if you said to God, I want to go deeper with you. I want to experience the real deal of faith 100% sold out to you. Doesn't that make you recoil just a little bit to think of really honestly saying that to God? Just take my whole thing. 
Is there something in your heart that's telling you you don't really want to pray that to God? Well, I urge you to go inside yourself and analyze what that might be. Maybe it's some kind of addiction to something. Maybe it's a love of some sin. What is it that you want to hold on to that's more important to you than following Jesus with your whole heart? If you figure out what that thing is, I urge you to hold it up to God and say, God, here's this thing. You already know about it. I feel like this thing is more important to me than you are. So help me come to love this thing less and you more. God, give me the strength from your storehouse of glorious riches. Give me power through your spirit in my inner being. If you honestly pray that, watch out. Because <laughs> he's going to hear your prayer. And he's going to do something dramatic in your life. A few years ago, uh, Annie and I and our friend Phil uh, were invited to go down to San Diego to uh, a, a Spirit Alive conference, which was a kind of a local church renewal conference. Uh, Phil, our friend, is a jazz musician. He lives now in Albany. He's been here to this church. He played trombone one day with me here. Uh, anyway, we got to the team meeting, and we were on this team, and the leader said, oh, by the way, I want a couple of you to give your testimony tonight. And he pointed to Annie and Phil. You guys are giving a testimony. They hadn't prepared this. They had no thought that this was coming up. You'll, you'll be on tonight at 7 o'clock. So they both kind of gulped and said, okay. <laughs> and I was very proud of both of them. Uh, the Lord did use them mightily. Uh, they were both people that at that time I didn't really think would just jump at that opportunity to get up and speak publicly to a big group of people they didn't know. But they both prepared and they spoke with great conviction and we found out later that the Lord really uh, found some soil in the hearts of people there with the things that, that Phil and Annie shared. Um, they are both people who have said to the Lord, okay Lord, use me in whatever way you want to do and I'll do it. What I remember uh, is in both cases, uh, the things that they shared with that group that, that evening, they had to remind themselves of strongly within 48 hours. We preachers find that all the time, that we have to preach to ourselves the very thing that we, pre we preach to everybody else that Sunday. But it was obvious that to me that the Spirit was speaking through those two wonderful folks. The point is I, I got to see two people used mightily in ways that they never would have predicted for themselves because they just said, Lord, use me. And he did. And it bore fruit powerfully and immediately. And that is cool. All of this starts in our prayer life with God. Paul's whole passage this morning was a prayer. He said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. He's praying for his people. He said, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you. And I pray that you be rooted and grounded in love, all that. That was his prayer for his church, for the people that he loved. Paul evidently had a pretty powerful prayer life. Our deep appreciation of these riches, of this height and depth and width and of Christ's love that Paul and Merton experienced, this probably is going to come to us in a time of prayer. We'll feel for ourselves this love that surpasses knowledge and experience this being filled with the fullness of God while, probably while we're in prayer someplace. So if you never sit down and purposely pray, you're probably going to miss this. It might happen while you're praying here with us in worship, but we don't really have a whole lot of time for just silent prayer in our service with Presbyterians. We keep talking. <laughs> you're going to have to experience this, whatever I'm talking about here, on your own time. So I'm going to ask you, can you give God maybe 15 minutes a week for prayer? That's all. 15 minutes a week? Maybe that's more than you're currently doing. Could you try 15 minutes twice a week? If you could start with that, Maybe you would begin to see the benefits and start wanting to spend more time seeking God in your heart. For me, I find it hard to just sit and do nothing and pray. So I pray at the piano. That works for me. I'm kind of ADD, as you know. i got to keep things going. So you know, some people like to pray and walk. Maybe they can't sit in a chair and pray. But whatever works for you, I want you to pray. You will benefit. Maybe you don't like praying alone, so you can find a friend who will pray with you. Maybe over the phone, maybe meet for coffee. Uh, 
we're trying to start a, a short prayer time before worship so if you can pray for our service um, we need to work on that a little bit more who will actually come if you think you might be willing to come a half hour early and go in and pray for us we need that we need that engine of prayer if you would begin to establish some regular times of prayer you'll start seeing the benefits of it and you the lord will bless it i know that he does We've always been a praying church, and we've been calling the people, calling people to pray for years. I'm standing up here this morning calling you to seek a deeper prayer life. You can ask Jesus for this, and he will answer that prayer. If you're still coming to church week by week and saying, is that all there is? I say, no. There's more than you can ever imagine, but you've got to seek it for yourself. You can just ask God for it, and he will give that to you. We can't do it for you. It's between you and the Lord. But Jesus Christ is right here with us. Anybody believe that? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And what he has in store for you is so amazing. You would just ask him for it. Jesus showed his more to Paul and to Peter, to me, to countless other people throughout the history of the church. And he will take you deeper too. So just ask him. Let's pray for a second. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every single person who's come through our doors today. Lord, you've promised us that there's more of you. There's more of your love that we can experience. There's more insight and understanding that you can grant to us, even with our limited minds. Lord, I'm praying for our church, Lord, that you would help us to go deeper with you, to understand you better, to experience your presence in a more real way day by day. Strengthen us and empower us to do this work for you, to serve you. And I pray in Jesus' name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll run a little long today. We have